During the Jurassic and Cretaceous period over 66 million years ago, every land animal larger than a badger was a dinosaur. The only possible exception being semi-aquatic crocodiles or some aerial pterosaurs. Compared to most of prehistory, this is extremely unusual, and there is usually a mix of distantly related species competing in the same habitats. Even today, where the vast majority of large animals are mammals, there are still large reptiles and birds that live alongside them in some ecosystems. This is something that really makes the dinosaur era stand out among other periods of time. But it wasn't always like this. During the Triassic period, over 200 million years ago, for many millions of years after the dinosaurs had just evolved, they were just one of many dominant animal groups prowling the Earth. However, this changed at the end of the Triassic and the beginning of the Jurassic period, when in a very small amount of time, many ancient groups of animals went extinct and then dinosaurs quickly swept up almost every niche available. The cause of this was a lesser known extinction event that heavily affected most animals alive at the time, apart from the dinosaurs. The Triassic was a weird time in the Earth's history. For most of the dinosaur era, or Mesozoic, the supercontinent Pangaea had broken up, having separated into clear individual continents by the middle of the Jurassic. But in the Triassic, it was at its peak, with the continents at their most compact, creating very extreme weather. The exact weather of Pangaea is heavily debated because there is a lot of disagreement on how mountainous it was, which can heavily impact weather systems, but Pangaea would have been like a more extreme version of Asia, the largest continent today, with very wet monsoonal environments on the coast, but then extremely dry arid environments with harsh temperature swings in the interior, being so far away from any oceans. Like deserts in China and Central Asia that swing from extreme desert heat in the summer to freezing temperatures in the winter. And Pangaea had two gargantuan continent-sized deserts contained within its coastline. And the coasts wouldn't have looked like the tropical coasts of today, because the vast majority of trees in the Triassic were conifers, as flowering and fruiting plants were yet to evolve, instead of the fruit and nut trees that dominate across the equator today, there would have been conifers. Seeing that all the continents were lumped into one, it would be sensible to suggest that the flora and fauna would be very similar across the world, but this was not the case. For a brief period of time in the very early Triassic, there was an unusually high number of just one animal, named Lystosaurus. But this was because the Earth was still in recovery mode after the Permian extinction, and this creature was one of the first animals to bounce back, giving it a big opportunity to dominate. By the middle of the Triassic, life had returned to its pre-extinction diversity, and there was a diverse tapestry of plants and animals spread across all of its many regions, as even without dividing seas, the mountains and deserts must have been adequate barriers for species to disperse and evolve on their own. The earliest dinosaur in the fossil record was a small omnivore named Nyasasaurus that lived in what would become modern-day Tanzania at least 240 million years ago. However, by the Middle Triassic, around 220 to 230 million years ago, dinosaurs had already evolved and divided into their main groups of sauropods, ornithopods, and theropods. Although, these divisions would have been less noticeable at the time, because dinosaurs had had less time to evolve and so were still very primitive. For instance, the earliest protosauropods, like Platyosaurus, that would have lived around this time, were still mobile on their hind legs alone and had much shorter, smaller front limbs that were still claw-like. There was also an early sauropod relative named Panphagia, which means eats all, because there is evidence that it was still omnivorous, being a stem from when the ancestors of sauropods weren't even fully herbivorous yet. And of course, all of the dinosaur groups were still incredibly small compared with their record-breaking sizes they would reach later. Despite their diversity, the dinosaurs were still very much just one group of animals among many. Despite some dinosaurs evolving into powerful predators, they had large non-dinosaur competitors, and despite already having large plant eaters, there were other animals filling similar niches. There were the decinodonts, that means two-toothed dog, that were herbivorous animals that were descendants of an early tangent in the mammal family tree. However, they retained many primitive traits, like having a smaller brain, they laid eggs, and they had a more reptilian gait. Found alongside the dinosaurs, their fossils are so numerous in places like South Africa, they were some of the first ancient creatures ever identified. Lysamphibia, the ancestors of today's frogs and salamanders, had probably only just emerged during the Triassic, and the waterways and rivers were instead filled with their larger ancient relatives, the Temnospondyls. By the middle of the Triassic, body sizes of 2 meters or more were common, 
But there were also some absolute monsters like Mastodon Saurus that may have grown to the size of a saltwater crocodile. There were a lot of strange animals in the Triassic too, like the Drapanosaurs, that were bizarre tree-climbing reptiles, and Tanistrophius that had almost half its body length taken up by its neck. However, despite the many groups of large animals that were coexisting throughout the Triassic, the largest and most dominant group of animals without question were known as the Pseudosuchians, which means false crocodile. Crocodiles, birds, and dinosaurs are known as archosaurs. Today, crocodiles are very homogenous, but during the Triassic, the crocodile lineage was considerably more diverse and widespread, and they were named the Pseudosuchians. Archosaurs that were more closely related to crocodiles than birds and dinosaurs. The largest predators of the Triassic were Pseudosuchians named Rauasuchids that looked a lot like crocodiles, but were adapted land animals. However, the Pseudosuchians also had herbivorous forms, like the Atosaurs, which are some of the most common herbivores in some habitats at the time, and some Pseudosuchians even looked like dinosaurs. So what caused the Earth's habitats to change so much? The earliest evidence for the existence of a mass extinction at the end of the Triassic was a sudden major replacement of more ancient animals like amphibians and Pseudosuchians to primarily dinosaurs, but also lizards and crocodiles. Later, it was found that the end of the Triassic and beginning of the Jurassic was inundated with many volcanic eruptions in the middle of Pangaea, and this is still the leading explanation. Throughout Western Africa, North America, South America, and parts of Europe, there are a series of basalt formations which are the most common form of volcanic rock, evidence of the numerous volcanic eruptions. All these regions would have been connected before the breakup of Pangaea, creating one gigantic volcanic footprint named the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. This is larger than the whole of the US and would have sat right in the middle of the supercontinent. Dating of these regions shows that the lava would have formed at the Triassic-Jurassic boundary around 200 million years ago. The issue is that the details of why and how this large volcanic activity caused the mass extinction is not fully understood. For instance, the Permian extinction was also caused by mass volcanic activity in what would become Siberia. However, not only was the Permian extinction worse in terms of the amount of species that went extinct, but it was also noteworthy for being absolutely devastating to marine life, which is in stark contrast to the Triassic-Jurassic extinction that was very bad for land animals, but comparatively marine habitats were much less affected. This suggests that although the causes of the extinction may have been the same, the exact way they played out may have been different. One difference was CO2 levels that were not only much higher during the Permian extinction, but also rose significantly quicker in a smaller amount of time. In the Triassic, CO2 was already quite high, and then got even higher, so the change wasn't as drastic. During the Permian extinction, this is what was responsible for the extremely high marine animal death toll. CO2 levels can cause ocean acidification that was very damaging to shellfish in particular, and rising sea temperatures can cause all sorts of issues for many different types of marine animal. The fact that Triassic extinction was so much worse for land animals has led some researchers to argue that the volcanism may have actually caused global cooling rather than warming like in the Permian. When ice sheets form, they can trap rock and debris that can be transported and then deposited when they melt. This phenomenon is known as ice rafted debris, and it can be identified in extremely old rocks. During the Triassic, parts of China were near the North Pole, and there is abundant ice rafted debris that is dated to the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, suggesting that despite the extremely high CO2 levels, the Earth's poles still experienced freezing temperatures, which is in stark contrast to the average global temperatures throughout most of the Triassic and Jurassic. It is thought that this drop in global temperatures may have been caused from the blocking of sunlight due to volcanic ash in the atmosphere which could have potentially been made much worse due to Pangaea being such a large landmass. Study of ancient ecosystems spanning across Pangaea in the second half of the Triassic has shown that dinosaurs were much more common at the coast and at higher latitudes. However, near the equator, although some small carnivorous dinosaurs were present, the vast majority of animals were Pseudosuchians. This pattern was even more visible with herbivorous dinosaurs, with the very ancient sauropod relatives being at their largest and most diverse at the poles whereas nearer the equator, nearly all herbivores were Pseudosuchians and other creatures that weren't dinosaurs. This suggests that the dinosaurs' first big evolutionary push was to occupy the niche as colder weather animals. If the Earth did go through an ice age or series of ice ages at the end of the Triassic, they may have been much better equipped to deal with the lower temperatures than the Pseudosuchians, and then in the Jurassic were able to fill in the gaps left over in the ecosystem. 
It could also just have been that volcanic activity caused an extended period of tumultuous climate, and the dinosaurs were more adaptable. But one thing is for sure, in a very short amount of time in the Jurassic, the dinosaurs completely took over, and no group of creatures has been as large or as dominant before or since. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons for supporting the channel, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.